Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If I could ask you to turn off your cell phones, that would be very helpful. Um, my name is Wendy Olenek. I am the Vice President of Finance and Administration for Harvest Energy Solutions. And very glad to be here with you today, the National Farm Machinery Show, uh, here in very cold rural Kentucky. Um, like many of you, we are a Midwestern family uh, in a family uh, business focused on trying to do the right thing. My husband Mark and I uh, live on a farm that is being powered by renewable energy and we are actually installing solar at our shop in Jackson, Michigan, a 280,000 square foot facility that we've owned for about 20 years. So we are implementing what we talk about here. Um, so from our family to yours, we'd like to welcome you and take, uh, talk about renewable energy in agriculture. So what is the importance of renewable energy in agriculture? It can save you money. It can increase your self-reliance. It can decrease your dependence. And it can reduce carbon emissions. We are here to provide information and insight necessary for you to make a conscientious decision on the untapped value of renewable energy. What role does renewable energy play in agriculture? Farmers, ranchers, and agribusiness owners face unpredictable and escalating costs of energy. One of the highest can be your electrical expenses, and that's what we're here to talk about, how we can help you with that um, additional cost for your, your operational bottom line. With advances in technology and reduction in costs, more farming operations are turning to renewable energy to improve their operational bottom line. So I have some questions for you. What if we could cut your electric bill in half. What if you found a way to produce your own electricity when and where you need it? What if you could lock in the cost of electricity at a drastically reduced rate for decades to come? What if you could increase your self-reliance? Uh, what if you could decrease your energy dependence? And what if you could do your part to reduce emissions for your family, your children, and your grandchildren? This seminar, will help answer these questions and give you the insight necessary to make an informed decision on how powering agriculture uh, with renewable energy is something you may want to look into. So where to begin? We know the process of implementing a new renewable energy product can seem overwhelming. We are here to help with the who, what, where, when, and how of renewable energy. We are pleased to bring you a panel of people that are experts in design, installation, distribution, USDA, and financing of renewable energy. Along with um, a farmer here that uh, has in, uh, installed a system on his own farm, he can speak to a lot of the questions that you may have directly. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this, so you can ask any one of us uh, questions that you may have. And uh, that's up to, here's my husband, Mark. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Olenek. I am the president and CEO of a company called Harvest Energy Solutions. Uh, we have a booth here. I don't know the number, but uh, you walk around and, uh, what does it see? 8130C. 8130C, you'll see it. It's the, uh, we're, we're touting it as the largest indoor solar display in the United States. And until somebody proves me wrong, I guess I'm going to stick with that story. Uh, as Wendy mentioned, our family's been in agriculture, probably like yours, uh, since uh, they arrived here from wherever they came from. In my case, uh, over 100 years ago. Uh, in in uh, the farming industry, in about the 80s, late 80s, I got into uh, grain storage. And uh, some of you that are my age-ish remember the pick and roll days and uh, outside of Jackson, Michigan, we warehoused over 11 million bushels for the USDA and uh, for four years after you all stored it for three years and uh, then we sold it to the Russians. But, uh, that, uh, so I, I, know, I know about grain storage and I know a little bit about farming. Um, after a while in farming, uh, I added manufacturing uh, to our list of, of uh, uh, careers and uh, we ended up uh, 
I don't want to take too much time on this, but we had a manufactured satellite antennas. We sold antennas to Primestar, to DirecTV, AT&T, Fox, uh, the small ones as well as the very large headed antennas. And uh, so we learned about manufacturing. And uh, we also installed those throughout the country. So uh, uh, another, another addition to our manufacturing was some uh, roofing products. So we now got into distribution. So the, the reason I'm bringing this stuff up is because we manufacture a lot of what you, you'll see in our booth. Uh, and uh, we're happy to do so. So over time, uh, we got into renewables as well. A friend of mine came up with a great idea of how uh, to manufacture this, this really neat little wind turbine. And uh, we spent a lot of money on it. We have patents on it. But eventually it was shelved uh, for several reasons. But, uh, but I was hooked. 2006, uh, we started into renewables. And uh, over time, uh, at, at that point in time, solar was twice the cost of, of uh, wind energy. Now it's half. So the, so the reason that we're pushing more solar now is it's passive, not mechanical, the price is less, and uh, it, the warranties are longer. So for a lot of good reasons, we got into solar. The idea of solar and having to do with uh, the agribusiness is you can lock in your price of energy going forward. There are so many incentives available and some of these other gentlemen will explain a little bit more about specifically about those incentives. But let's take advantage of them. If you don't, your neighbor will. And, and, uh, and one of these days they may be gone. But uh, we literally have sold systems in Kentucky where a farmer has gotten all of his investment back in one tax cycle. It doesn't happen very often. But I just want to give you an extreme to let you know that it does happen. Uh, and so other things like uh, an increased property value, obviously that a, uh, a, a solar system or array on your farm will increase the value. If you don't think it will increase your value, uh, I'll take it and because I'm telling you uh, there's value there because you're locking in energy for the next generation or whoever you might sell the property to eventually. So again, like I mentioned, uh, things like the price of solar has, has come down. It literally has come down about 50% in the last five years. The product's getting better all the time. There's very few things in this whole building that you can say that has the incentives that solar has, that has a, a decreasing price, although I think it's just about bottomed out. Uh, but the price is very reasonable now. An example, most of you can buy a solar installed turnkey system for between three and four dollars, depending on the size. It was not five years ago, it was probably at least double that. Uh, so it's, it's probably a good time to consider it. Another thing is the ITC has been continued for five years. That's an investment tax credit. Again, somebody else will probably talk about that, but that's a big deal in our industry and it works, it'll help all of you make a, a final decision if you're considering something like this. So I guess uh, in closing on my little speech, uh, I just want to say that I doubt very much that anybody in, there's anybody in here that cannot take advantage of solar and uh, it, it probably has a, uh, a place somewhere on your home, farm, or agribusiness and uh, all we need to do is convince you uh, that it makes sense and believe me, uh, it's, it works. We have it on our farm, we're putting 150 kilowatts at our shop and we're doing it because it works. Yes, we sell it, but we're doing it because it really works. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lucas Olenek. I, as Wendy mentioned, we, this is a family business. I am Mark's son. I've been with the business since 2010. Uh, a little bit of my background. Uh, studied mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan. I uh, hope that doesn't offend anyone in here. Uh, but uh, did a little bit of software development things for a couple years and actually got into the, the family business back in 2010. Um, and have been designing solar and other renewable energy systems <laughs> since then. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the process of what it takes to go from just the idea of putting solar on your, your facility and actually implementing that, that vision. Uh, there's a lot of steps involved uh, for a lot of people, especially if you have motives like, I'd like to reduce my energy costs, as Mark was mentioning. 
I want to get greener, uh, but there is still a design process. What is the ideal system for my situation? Everybody's different. Everybody has different, uh, a different carbon footprint, different needs. So I'd like to walk you through how we decide what is the best fit for you uh, as a farmer or a small business owner. So first you have to establish what the goal is. Uh, then we get into an energy assessment. Uh, then there's utility requirements, permitting requirements through the utility and some of the county and city uh, requirements. Uh, then once we go through items one through four, there's a site assessment. We issue a proposal. Uh, we design the system. We go through some of the unique project requirements. We install the system and then we basically monitor the system and we will show you that actually Harvest will help you make a complicated process made simple. So first, any, with anything, uh, any decision you make, what, what is the goal? You have to establish what the goal is. Is the goal to be green? Is the goal to offset my power? Is the goal to take advantage of some of the tax incentives? Uh, depends on your situation, but with, with Harvest help and with some of the other help from the panel up here, hopefully you can answer at least a few of those questions and see us in the booth after if you have more questions on the, the, the process and the details of it. So the goal, each customer has a different set of goals and it's our goal to install quality products and make it as smooth as possible for the customer. The second step, uh, energy assessment. So the first step we take with actually looking at your utilities is uh, looking at the bill itself. So you'll see on your energy bill, your kilowatt hour usage on a monthly, annual basis, and you will see uh, basically the trends you're, you're doing on that particular meter. If you have several meters, you'll have to tie different solar arrays to different meters because it's typically one system per meter. Um, you'll look at the annual energy usage. How much on an annual basis are you actually consuming? And then the production analysis. So how much will we have, how, how big of an array can I make to offset that power or offset most of that power or whatever your, your plans may be? Next, we get into some of the utility requirements. So each parent utility and REC have their own, in most cases, policy on grid-tied solar. Uh, utility websites usually have this information published, but we like to place a phone call and actually talk to a person to just ensure ourselves and our customers that we know what that policy is and we know what that interconnection agreement, they call it, is gonna look like when we actually sign up to tie a grid to their utility grid, or tie an array to their utility grid. Um, Utilities will have certain requirements like type of interconnection, uh, the, the maximum system size, how big of a system can you put on. If you need 100 kilowatts on your farm, the utility might only allow you to put up to 20 kilowatts, then that's going to be your limit. Um, and then maybe certain utilities will say you can, you can not exceed your current usage. So if you can put 100 kilowatts, they'll allow you to put 100 kilowatts, but not 101 kilowatts, say. So it just depends on the situation, what state and what utility company you have. Permitting requirements is varies. Luckily for the ag business, this is not as painful as a process, say, as in cities and things like that. Um, typically, we'll have to apply for a building permit, um, an electrical permit, and we'll have to get some certain zoning requirements as well. Uh, but we help with that process. So the site assessment is when we physically come to the property, we'll actually take notes on, I think it's about 150 different uh, bullet points we have to hit on what we have to assess the property to see how much allowable space, what kind of geography are we looking at where we want to put the array? Are there shady concerns? Are there grade concerns? Obviously, it's harder to put salt on a hill than it is to put it on the level ground. Uh, soil conditions, if you're in a bedrock area, that becomes a problem with, uh, with foundations. Uh, the wire run, are we looking at a simple wire run of 30 feet or is it gonna be more like 1,000 feet? Uh, and then your tilt angle is a pretty simple calculation based on your, your latitude. Where's the geography of your, your uh, array gonna go? Uh, structures, so if, if you're say going to do a roof mount, there's some load uh, considerations to look at for, for putting our array on your roof. And customer preferences, you know, if, if there's two options the customer has to put the array on the ground or up on the roof or in the backyard somewhere, ultimately you're going to be staring at it for 30 years. Where do you want to put it? What's the best decision long term to put it? So more items in the site assessment. Um, so roof versus ground, which I mentioned, the sun charge, which, which will tell you based on your latitude you know, how many peak sun hours you're going to get in a year, which is kind of a technical term. I'm not going to get too, too in detail here. Um, there's, there's firefighter access codes. There's, there's certain static and dynamic loads, like 90 miles an hour typically in your area is going to be the, the building code to uh, design your, your system to. Your service, your service is a big one. So your existing service, say, is going to be a typical house, it's going to be like a 100 amp or 200 amp panel. 
um, and it's going to be like a single phase 240 volt system. A lot of farms will have 480 volt three phase, uh, 240 delta just depends on everything. So your system needs to be designed to that service. And there's a chance that service also needs to be upgraded. Not a big chance, but when it gets inspected, when our system gets inspected when it's built, they're, all, they're also going to have to look at that service to say, you know, we have to also approve the services up to code. So there's a chance that, but we can look at that beforehand, before they show up and say, you know what, we won't want to install because we think you need a service upgrade before you consider solar. So those, those are all things we can walk you through. And the interconnection. Um, general format for the proposal. Uh, just basically, once we do a site assessment, what we'll do is we'll issue a formal proposal. It's about 12 to 15 pages, just depending on uh, your situation. Sometimes customers will have several proposals and like a master agreement uh, because they're putting like four or five solar rates in different properties, so we'll kind of bundle it all together. Uh, but basically, it just goes through a, a harvest scope of work. What, what is included with this with this system? Um, performance estimates. How many kilowatt hours am I going to generate on an annual basis in harvest estimate? Um, what warranties are involved? So there's going to be a solar panel warranty, there's going to be an inverter warranty, then we actually provide a workmanship warranty. So you want to look at all of that. Um, customer requirements, just making sure that we have, you know, exec, we, we can access the site to build and everything like that. And, um, system cost, obviously an important one. Progress payments, um, and we'll walk you through some of the incentives. Um, and we'll actually do a return of investment calculation for you in our proposal. However, it's it's much advice to use an accountant to actually run through our numbers just to make sure that the math is right because we are not certified accountants up here. We're just giving you an idea of what the payback is going to be. <laughs> and exhibits, we'll get into some of the design details of the system. You know, um, the production estimates, the site layout, um, the one-line electrical drawing, that kind of thing. So, Design and engineering, uh, the type of solar panels, inverters, and racking that you're going to use um, will be established during this process. Uh, electrical assessment, so if there's an issue with that service, we'll address that situation. Uh, utility requirements, so maybe they'll have an extra application you have to put in once the array is built, or they'll have an inspector come in before you can turn it on. There's all sorts of different things, but it's actually pretty painless once we get into it because we've done it so much. Um, and then once once the system's commissioned, it's uh, internet requirements. So if you have a system that is uh, going to be monitored on the internet, you want to make sure that we have the internet tied to the array. So that's one other consideration. Uh, unique project requirements, so say in this situation we have a customer that has a uh, construction deadline to meet, say um, we need this array by April 30th and no later because of this and this and this reason, or uh, for instance there's some reason that you have a delayed construction request. Uh, we can't start building until May 1st or something like that. Um, project is a new build, so a new build requires special permission from the utility because they don't have a history of your um, your, your energy usage. So uh, that situation will, will affect the schedule a little bit. Um, trucks and trailers going in the backwoods obviously is going to be a problem, that kind of thing. Um, customer has to move something and there's additional paperwork that has to be handled before you can actually install it. And then customer preferences. We like to uh, consider all options when we're doing installations as far as using local help. Uh, and the customer typically will have a electrician, a concrete supplier, an electrical house, so we can actually utilize those those uh, those things and to help us with our installation and use their people. So uh, they can be confident that we can uh, be more of a local installation. And then we actually show up on site, and these are just a few pictures of our install guys uh, putting a, a ground mount in. Um, and typically a residential or an agricultural installation that we do takes between one and three days and we're, we're done. That's, that's all it takes. Interconnection commissioning, I, I touched on this a little bit, but the technical and practical aspects of connecting a solar array to the grid is called the interconnection. And commissioning is actually getting, uh, officially bringing the solar array to service um, after your inspector signs off on the system, is when you can literally take the switch into the on position and it's producing power. Uh, the last, last thing here is uh, metering and monitoring. So once you're up, you want to make sure that you're monitoring your array to make sure it's, uh, it's actually producing what you had been promised it was going to, um, what the trends are. If you had, say, uh, 20 cloudy days that month, is your production down? Is it just kind of doing what you thought it was going to do? And uh, Harvest will actually look at some of that stuff and, and, and help you to see if, you know, it was a, a normally cloudy week or a cloudy, cloudy month or a sunny month, 
Um, so those trends are actually normal. So you're never actually going to produce exactly what um, what you estimated because weather is obviously unpredictable. So, but we can get within probably five percent when it comes to solar, five percent production throughout the year. Here's just a picture of a monitoring system. Uh, this is a inverter system called Solar Edge. So um, this is just showing the solar panels down here. You can see uh, the lower left hand, lower right hand corner. Those are actually solar panels um, and a computer screen that will show you how much you're producing if a panel's giving trouble, that kind of thing. Um, what's that? So I guess in a nutshell, the, the process is a little complicated, but you know that's what we're here for. So. We just want to make sure that you get the best bang for your buck when you're picking a designer and an installer. Um, can they can they fit your needs? How long has that company been in business? Are they NAPSEP certified, which is actually the standard for um, certification in the solar area? We have four NAPSEP certified people. Um, what is their level of experience? And the company you choose can make all the difference in simplifying the process. And we will get back to you as soon as we can. Um, and a complicated process made seamless for the customer. Um, because we have experience design, engineering, and installation. So, without further ado, this is Ken. Hello, my name is Ken Zavera. Um, <coughs> Harvest hired me as an engineer uh, about four years ago, and uh, now I'm the territory sales manager for Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio. Um, I'm NAPSEP certified. I also have uh, a four kilowatt uh, solar array in my house. Um, but uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, is solar affordable? How is it affordable? What's the right situation? Uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, incentives and financing. The big, the big incentive is your 30% tax credit. That, that's a straight credit, uh, not a deduction, and that's 30% that's of your total investment. Now, you don't have to necessarily have that tax liability that year. You can actually carry that credit back a year or forward 20 years. In addition to that, uh, you depreciate it. So you depreciate it on, on, in addition to that tax credit. Um, those two pieces are guaranteed, assuming you pay taxes. What I mean is you don't have to apply for them or anything like that. Uh, the, the USDA REIT grant uh, could get you 25% of the total cost as well, but we've got a, a, a USDA representative here that will talk more about that. Um, there's also frequently state or local uh, programs, incentives, rebates. Um, Ohio has a, a, a state tax credit. There, there used to be a program in Michigan that, that uh, no longer exists uh, that actually pays you more uh, for what you make from the solar power than what you pay them uh, for your usage. Your payback in return, uh, you, you know, you're reducing operational costs, you're saving money on your electric bills, you're increasing your property value, you've touched on those, but the big thing you want to remember is, is that it's, it's, it's a very solid long-term investment. So you've got to keep in, in mind two long-term factors. The panels have a production warranty of 25 years, uh, giving them a legitimate lifetime of at least 30 years, uh, probably 40 or 45, but you've got to remember it's not something, if, if you see your money back in eight years, it's not, it's not going to be uh, useless in 10 years. So um, the other thing is, is you're, you're banking on your electric rate increasing. The higher your electric rate goes, the more valuable your solar is. So in terms of, in, in terms of uh, the value of your solar energy, you want your rate to continue to increase. Um, so keep those in, in mind. Uh, the future, oh, another thing I wanted to mention, you, your payback in return, um, now, obviously, it depends on, on your location and your incentives and your tax situation. It depends on a lot of factors. But a rough, realistic average is four to seven years on, on a payback period. The future of renewable energy, um, it's, uh, while well, the prices have been coming down in the well, more four or five years ago, but they've been coming down a little lately as well. But, um, the 30% tax credit in December got extended uh, through 2021. Uh, that was a pretty big deal. Um, we've got section 179. And uh, another thing is, is uh, that I wanted to mention is kind of a going green aspect. Um, a lot of the, the investment, the financial part of it, is the biggest part. But we've got a lot of customers like uh, wineries or farm markets, things like that, that, that you know, they put their, their production on their website. And it's more of a marketing tool for them, too. Uh, so that's an all added benefit if you're in a, a scenario like that. 
Um, and uh, here's our USDA representative. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Moss. I'm the Rural Energy Coordinator for USDA Rural Development here in uh, Kentucky. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of, what, of the REAP program, the Rural Energy for America program. This was a program that's been established for a number of years now. It helps with agricultural producers and also rural small businesses with any type of energy efficiency upgrade or renewable energy project. And basically we have, it's a grant program where you can receive up to 25% of the cost of the project as a grant or a guaranteed loan where we can guarantee up to 75% of the project. And I'll go over some thresholds in, in a minute. Uh, basically, to be eligible for the program, you have to be either an agricultural producer, which means that you're producing at least 50% of your gross income from your farm. What we do is we look at your Schedule F and your 1040 to see what that ratio is, and if you qualify as an ag producer, then we'll, we'll pursue that direction. Or you can qualify as a small business, and a small business basically means if you don't qualify for an ag producer, potentially you can qualify as a small business as a farmer. Um, you do have to be located in a rural area, which is a population of 50,000 or less, and you have to have an NAICS code and a DUNS number, but that in most cases that's no problem. What we can do as an agency, you can compete for a grant for up to 25% of your cost uh, for a grant. And for a renewable energy project, solar project, we're looking at a minimum grant of 2,500 and a maximum grant up to 500,000. For energy efficiency, we go a minimum grant of 1,500 with a maximum up to 250. Um, this is a competitive program. Every state has all allocations to the state for competition. Uh, every state fluctuates on the amount of money that's available in their state. Uh, but it is a competition, depending on the state that you're located, uh, will determine really how competitive it is. Here in Kentucky, we're always oversubscribed with this program. We fund roughly about 80% of our applications on a yearly basis. And the funding will fluctuate. Last year we had over 2.2 million available in grant funds. This year we're looking at roughly about 750 to 800,000. So a dramatic drop from last year. We also have a guaranteed loan program. This is really what I'm here trying to promote today. Uh, we can guarantee a loan up to 75% of your project up to a $25 million project. The advantage to you as an applicant or as the owner of the, of the panels would be that the lender can really go outside their norm when it comes to their financial covenants, their terms and conditions. They can go up to the useful life of the solar array. So in some cases up to 20, 25 years. I don't recommend that, but they can do that. Um, they also will allow, uh, you know, hopefully a better interest rate as they can sell that guaranteed portion on the secondary market. And they also allow some flexibility on your down payment or your equity involvement in the project. With the REIT program, we only have to show that you have 25% invested in the project. Now that could be another loan with another lender or with your commercial lender or a non-traditional lender or it can be a, a cash injection, whatever it might be. But for the REIT program, it does give a lot of flexibility regarding capital injection, capital investment in the project. We have a deadline that's quickly approaching, uh, May 2nd, for any grant or combo application. Um, then for the guaranteed loan program, it's open year round. We can accept applications year round. Again, what I would recommend is if you're outside of Kentucky to contact or look on our website and to see who, you, who is the energy coordinator for your area, contact them directly to see if what's available in your state what the competition level, et cetera, is. And then May 2nd, again, is the deadline for this program. So, that's all I have. Well, good morning, Greg McGuire here. Uh, company is Financial Services Unlimited Incorporated. We are a private investment capital services firm, but our focus is business finance, which includes agricultural, ag business, a lot of renewable energy, now, Ken kind of stole my thunder here. Uh, ITC is a big deal. Whether you can use it or not, we can work it into your financing for the program. And we'll talk about that a little further. Financing options, uh, we try to do, as Harvest does, is we try to make a complicated process a little less painful. 
And so that's my job to help you work through the system without all the, all the aggravations. I give you a little bit, but not all of it. Uh, typical financing is as typical ag loans, commercial loans are available for renewable financing, capital leases, tax leases, you also have up to operating leases. Operating leases, uh, then what you're looking at is two options. Number one, which is the good news with the investment tax credit, is that the ITC, which could be taken by the bank or the investor or the finance company, and as a result, then the financing that you would receive actually can be a negative interest rate. Now, we can also do operating leases. Let's just say that you need the ITC. That's something that you can use either this year, previous, or in, in the future. You can still use the ITC. We can still do the financing on an operating lease. An operating lease quite often is off balance sheet, which would mean you don't, you don't have to show the liability. So if you have bank covenants, uh, the liabilities will have to show up on your balance sheet as a debt. That's one way around some of the bank covenants. Legal, taxable, no problems. Uh, as an operating lease, you also can do, can lease the monthly payments, or I'm sorry, expense the monthly payments on your income taxes. So you get the write off of the ITC. If you want to choose ITC, or you can expense the payments, and you get the write off of that. At the end of the lease, you then will depreciate the asset. So you can take advantage of all the tax loans based on how you want to structure the financing. Considerations, of course, is how much money do you want to put down? A lot of finance companies are going to require 20, 25% down. Our table of finance program requires no investment up front. Uh, the, uh, the benefit, again, of the ITC, do you want the ITC or not? We can help you to go through that, work that out. Do you want to secure the equipment with your real estate? Many lenders will finance renewable energy, but they want a mortgage on your property. That's a big consideration. If you're fine with that, we can do that very simply. If you want to protect your real estate, you can use the equipment as the collateral, finance 100%, and then you don't have to uh, tie up additional collateral. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Obviously, everything's about cash flow. When you take a look at a system and you want to do look at the financing, what we would try to do is match, what we will do is match up the cash flow with your, uh, the expense of the system itself. Uh, we have a farmer, the system's been in about a year and a half, talked to him the other day. He said that he has not paid electric, he's paid one electric bill since the system was installed. And that was, he had the green guard from it. So that's pretty impressive. So the math works. So if you want to learn more about that, we'd be glad to help you out. I can be in the booth, I can be up front. If you have any interest uh, in discussing that, please let me know. The process, we try to make it simple. Usually over 100,000, you have a basic credit application, you're gonna have to do tax returns. Once in a while, you will have to, if it's a complicated process or a larger prime transaction, uh, we'd be looking at uh, maybe a debt schedule. Uh, always put a quote, but that's easy to get. And per periodically, uh, like her reports uh, or debt schedules. I thank you for your time. Okay, we have we have a short video um, that we'd like for you to stay and watch. We'll, after that, we'll have a question and answer, and answer session. We have some giveaways, and we have the opportunity to win three five hundred dollar gift certificates towards a solar array install uh, throughout the course of two thousand and sixteen. So. Welcome to American Farmer. I'm Charlie Cowan. The latest sustainable solutions are positively impacting the lives of hardworking Americans who dedicate themselves to agriculture. Learn more next. Agriculture is an important part of the U.S. economy and culture. It is proving to play an important role in the use of renewable energy. Farmers have the tradition of being stewards of the land, and their investment in renewable energy supports their role of protecting land, air, and water. A lot of farmers use a lot of energy. If you know anybody in that industry, you'll know that they have fans and lights running almost 24-7. So the idea of renewables, uh, farmers being as independent as they are, they are looking for an alternative to fossil fuels. Given the fact that uh, 
energy prices have been rising and we expect some of them to continue to rise, especially electricity and propane uh, fuel. Energy has become an important factor with regards to operational viability of the farm. With solar energy coming down in terms of implementation prices, it just kind of makes sense in terms of the financial viability of the farm to find the least cost resource that provides stability and the energy needs of that farm. Solar energy, like other renewables, offers an opportunity to stabilize energy costs, decrease pollution and greenhouse gases, and delay the need for electric grid infrastructure improvements. The United States is actually pretty far behind Europe in renewable energy. In Europe, oil prices are higher, gasoline prices are higher, so they have more of an incentive, say, to look for renewable options that can basically offset their, their usage. In this country, it's not as big of an issue, say, 10 years ago, but it is becoming more of an issue due to energy inflation and things like that. Renewables are actually becoming quite viable. Over the past two decades, technological advances and increased production of solar panels have made solar power dramatically less expensive. Today, the availability and cost efficiency of solar energy has become a viable option for farms of all sizes and business levels. The sun is giving me photons of light right now, and that's how you get sunburn. That's also how solar works. Is solar panels are made of different materials, and those different materials actually will take in the photons of light, electrons get excited, and they can pass through those layers. And when those electrons will touch a conductive material, they create electricity. And you can actually tie several solar panels together and combine your electricity into something that you need for an application. Solar PV is photovoltaic power, so it's electricity. The temperature of the sun has nothing to do with the intensity of solar PV. Solar PV actually works better in cool conditions. Solar PV has more to do with the particles of light than the intensity of the heat of the light. Um, so solar thermal, for instance, is a different technology that actually heats water, whereas solar PV actually creates electricity at a voltage and amperage, which you can actually control. Specializing in agricultural, commercial, and rural residential installations, Harvest Energy Solutions provides full design and installation of renewable energy systems throughout the Midwest. Harvest Energy provides a turnkey system. We work with the farmer to determine what their needs are, and then we come out to the farm, we do a site assessment, we discuss it with the township, we discuss it with the utilities, and come up with a system that works for that unique farmer. There are several incentives offered to farmers for an installation of solar. There's an ITC, which is an investment tax credit of 30%. Uh, you can depreciate the product like a piece of farm equipment. There's also a REAP grant available through the USDA, and that'll count for about 25%. And then there's some local incentives sometimes as well. At times, you will receive up to 60 or 70% of the total cost through incentives. So when you're finished, a lot of times, with all these incentives in place, the end result of what you might pay might be 30 or 40 percent of the total cost. So the design process isn't necessarily cookie cutter because it's going to be different everywhere you go. But that site assessment has to hit all the bullet points of A, financially, does it make sense? B, are you hitting your green energy goals as a, as a person, as a human consuming energy? Um, and C, does it make sense for your site to actually physically have solar on your site? Capturing the sun's energy for light Heat, hot water, and electricity can be a convenient way to save money, whether drying crops, running a dairy, letting a poultry operation, or powering a water pump. Using the power of the sun can make a farming operation more efficient. Energy costs in agribusiness are huge, and they're variable depending on the season. I know our energy costs change based on the weather, whether we're doing a lot of irrigating or not. We looked at solar energy as uh, a long-term solution to energy costs. We know that there is a payback over a certain amount of time, yet those panels and the energy will produce will go well beyond that. Up to this point, our monthly savings are anywhere from $800 to $1,200 per month. We're getting into our busy season where we're going to be using more and more energy and we expect to see savings anywhere from fifteen to $2,000 a month. The cost of solar energy has fallen sharply over the last 20 years. The growing global demand for solar power has translated into manufacturing and raw material reductions, resulting in price declines on par with consumer electronics. On our house side, in the south, 
summertime, it's eliminated our electric bill. On the shop side, in the summertime, it's reduced the bill a third. And, and with the op operation that we have, the electric bills are huge. My family is everything to the farm. I enjoyed my time even with my grandpa, both of them. They both farm, and then I worked with my dad every day until he was to where he couldn't see to drive anymore, and then we decided maybe he didn't need to run the equipment, but it'd be midnight or one o'clock, and the parking lot would still be at the end of the field. I think the first panels went in about a month ago already, and so the bill should reflect that pretty soon. It was easier for me to look at the meter so I could tell how much we were producing and how much we were using. And there were some days that were just about a wash. So we would recommend Harvest Energy. The salesman, easy to work with, explains it in my language or something that we could understand. And they just treat us good, you know, and everything that they said was right. And they were hot. Harvest Energy Solutions is passionate about improving the lives of hardworking American farmers and agribusiness owners and believes there's a tremendous amount of untapped value in renewable energy. We really like to partner with our customers. We don't, we don't see it as a customer supplier relationship. We see it as a partnership. We are a company that will actually look out for the customer's best interest for their finances. So we're not out there selling basically solar systems or wind turbines or whatever else we sell in the renewable sector to customers that don't need something. Um, if it makes financial sense for them, and that's a decision they want to make to purchase a renewable system, then we'll promote that to them. Harvest Energy Solutions continues to raise awareness on the efficiencies of using solar energy through a safe, secure, low-maintenance alternative to gain energy independence. Harvest Energy is positioning itself to assist the industry going forward. We at Harvest Energy believe we found an unmet need within the farming community. Farmers are always looking for another crop to harvest. Well, we can provide them one. They can harvest the sun and the energy from the sun with Harvest Energy solar installations. For more information, visit www.harvestenergysolutions.com or call 1-877-788-0220. Harvest Energy, providing renewable energy and energy-saving products throughout the Midwest. Thanks for tuning in to American Fire. We hope you'll join us next time as we explore more products, people, Okay, so we have about 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers. Uh, you've uh, met everyone on the panel with the exception of Eugene Jones. Mr. Jones is there on the other red cat. Uh, he's a customer of ours in St. John, Michigan. He installed a 16 kilowatt system in 2014, and he has a 300 acre soy and soybean and corn, corn farm. Retired from GN, is an advocate for green energy products, so he's one of our biggest advocates out there. So, questions? Anybody? Young lady in the front there. Just out of curiosity. Just out of curiosity, no matter what type of farm you're running, one of our greatest fears are barn fires. What sort of fires do you run with these? That's a good question. I'll get that one to loop. Sure. You knew that was coming. <laughs> I'm not the insurance guy. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so typically when you when you purchase a system, whether it's on the ground or on the roof, you're going to want to get insurance for it. So you know, just like any other asset you have on your farm, like a, a vehicle, a tractor, your house, it's all insured. So just like that, a solar array would have to be insured. Um, it's not a lot of money to insure a solar array. However, you just need to make sure that that policy covers the fire that happens on that barn. Um, and as far as uh, protection, um, the firefighters show up. There is actually uh, um, some some things put into place so that that uh, solar array does not endanger the firefighters that show up to, to put it out or anything because that's live power up there, you know. So when you have a fire coming through the, the roof, you want to make sure that that is disconnected and all that. So hopefully that answers your question. I think you meant is it a fire hazard? Is it a fire hazard? Well, start a fire. It's all you all listed, um, just like anything that you buy, uh, like a lamp or um, a coffee maker, it's all you all listed materials, so just as likely as a pot, coffee pot is to light a fire, I suppose a solar array would, would be just as likely. Never heard of one. Actually, 
I've never heard of one. <laughs> so hopefully that hopefully. No, we we have uh, gosh, I want to say hundreds at this point of systems in the area and we haven't had any issues with fires. So. You got it. Okay, next one. Not sure who can answer this, but we have a three-phase uh, power system in our grain bins and a single-phase system for our shop. Can one array on a rooftop power both single-phase and three-phase, or do you need two separate arrays? I actually do know the answer to this, but I am the moderator, so I'm going to give this one to Ken. <laughs> so you can, um, you can, the solar panels generate DC power, and they dump into a, uh, an inverter that outputs whatever your grid voltage is, single phase or three phase. So you can physically locate the panels in one location on your roof or in one ground space. You can physically locate them in one space and, and we can design and wire a three phase system or you know, X number of panels to go to this three phase meter and X number of panels uh, to generate single phase and go to this meter. And we can calculate how much you'll want to do at each. Um, does that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Right in front of you there, Eric. Gentleman in the black hat. If you've already applied and, and, and gotten a REAP a grant, can you do, for another system, can you do it again? That's a very good question, and we will let Scott answer. Yes, you can. Uh, you're, you're eligible to apply one per year. As long as your system that you were awarded for in the previous year is commissioned and in operation, you're eligible to, uh, to apply for future grants. Now you will, you are at a little disadvantage when it comes to scoring because the scoring is based on a first time applicant compared to a second time and there's a time frame there, I think two years, uh, that if you're applying that two year period, you won't get any points, but you can apply. Yes, it's a good question. Next question. Still in the read part of it. Uh, you mentioned May 2nd. Is that a national standard or is that a state standard? No, that is the national deadline for the uh, read for fiscal year 15 or 16 is May 2nd. That's for grants and combo applications. And why did the Funding is a you said Kentucky went down from a few right. million to uh, is that national. I mean, like, yes, I mean, uh, Indiana did it. the funding go down to Indiana also. Yes, last year in fiscal year 15, we actually had two fiscal years of funding last year, so our numbers were extremely high. Um, the numbers for 16 actually came out just a few days ago, and due to the sequestering of early, earlier in December, they did reduce our number. Of our total uh, prod program amount. So the allocation to the each state will be a little bit less than what was projected earlier in the year. Uh, so what I would recommend is call your local office in your state, find out what the actual level is. I actually have a, a sheet I can tell you, give you a rough estimate of what it is. But uh, yes, it, 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 it's effective nationally for everybody, for every state. And answer your question. Do we have another question? Do you run into issues with the power companies not wanting to cooperate or not wanting you to install solar energy because you're taking business from them or no? Uh, sometimes. The, the uh, smaller REMCs, I would say there's, maybe not frequently, but it's, it's not uncommon to run into issues like that uh, on the RE, small REMCs. On larger investor-owned utilities, uh, they're forced to allow to allow this within certain parameters, and uh, you know, they, they, to them, you know, we're not when we interconnect a solar array, we're not dealing with you know the investors and the higher ups that are that are losing revenue on this. We're dealing with engineers and people in an office that are just doing their job. So, you know, unless we're dealing with small REMCs, it's it's not an issue. They're forced to allow this within certain parameters. Can an RMC keep you from doing it? Um, yes, uh, I shouldn't say that. They they can't keep you from installing it. They can, but they can, uh, but they don't have to allow the net metering process, or they can control um, the dollar amount that they credit you in that net metering policy or process. 
So, you know, they can't physically stop you from installing this, but they can say that we're not paying you for this or you can't interconnect it this way. Uh, also, on, on the REIT situation, do, do you usually have grant writers on your applications or do people do it themselves? Um, in Kentucky, we have a network that's been established that, uh, for grant writers and energy auditors. Uh, we encourage grant writers in Kentucky is because of the competitive nature of the program. If you're going to submit an app, we want you to compete. And so uh, we found that usually a grant writer, an experienced grant writer, is worth your time and your money. However, we don't require it. It's not required. Um, and with the new application that's been uh, uh, developed over the last year or so, uh, if it's a smaller project, you probably can do the application yourself. Uh, but for anything larger, uh, we encourage it, but we don't require it. Talking dollar values, <clears throat> Talking dollar amounts, uh, size of the project, total project cost, and grant amount. So usually, if it's an $80,000 project or less, you could probably do the application yourself uh, without any, and with the help of Harvest or whoever's uh, putting it in the system. Uh, but if it's a larger program, larger project, uh, just due to the competitive nature of the program, we encourage the program right, but it's not required. Is it possible to do a commercial site and sell electric to that local electric company? For REIT? In a big way. A for big REIT? Way. Yes, sir. We can go up to a $25 million project for the guaranteed loan. We can do up to $500,000 on the, on the, on the, the grant. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that it if you've got a large system like that, you're not really going to compete well when it comes to the grant. Uh, we would encourage you to look at the guaranteed loan side. But yes, we can do larger systems. Um, North Carolina last year uh, led the nation in, in uh, solar arrays. They did over, I forget how many millions, it's over $100 million worth of, of guaranteed loans and projects in North Carolina. Uh, it's well over $100 million. So uh, yes, we can do larger programs larger commercial projects. Good morning, I've got a couple of questions. Do I have to be grid type or can I do a standalone? Okay. Um, you don't have to be, but that's by far the most cost effective. We can easily design an off-grid scenario with batteries. Um, that's all doable. It's it, it just at this moment, it's not, cost, it's not nearly as cost effective as being grid type. Okay, in the future, if I wanted to uh, expand the system and include uh, another barn or two, how would I do that? Would I have to build another solar array or could I tie into the existing solar array? You want to think about it as far as your metering goes. So if you're adding, uh, if you're adding that barn uh, through a new breaker in your existing service uh, without a new meter, then that solar array will feed everything that's distributed through that main. So it would feed that, that uh, service and depending on what you're going to be, the loads you're going to be using, you can add panels to account for it. Um, if it's going to be a completely new meter uh, then, uh, and, and account with the power company, then it would, be, it would have to be a separate and new solar array of whatever size depending on your, your needs there. Uh, there yeah, there's, there's other factors on that too. Um, if you, if, within reason, yeah, within reason, you can you can always add to a system, but you got to. It's not quite that simple. Your wire size is now going to have to increase. The the uh, sub panel may have to increase. Your inverters may have to increase. So you kind of want to have an idea for it ahead of time, and we can plan for that. Gentleman White. So when the sun doesn't shine, do you have a battery backup or recharge the battery <coughs> in those days or not? Well, so when he asked about the grid tide, when I say it's more cost effective to be grid tied, what that means is you're net metering with the utility, which most utilities are forced to allow that, and that means that you consume the power first, and when you're overproducing on, on a sunny day, then uh, that you're credited for that from the utility, and, you're, and on cloudy days and nighttime, you're buying it from them. And we size the system so that you're going back and forth, back and forth, and, and ideally net zero at the end of the year. So because of them being forced to allow that process, you don't need batteries because the system will be designed to overproduce during the day to account for what you use at nighttime and on cloudy days. 
Yeah, I, I guess I don't understand how do you meter uh, to the utilities and back again. How do they how do you they charge that? Yeah, so the the, the solar uh, intentionally pushes at a higher at a slightly higher voltage than the grid, so it knows to feed your loads first, and then it knows once your loads are satisfied to push on the grid. And the meter and, and the utility will put in a new meter that reads it both ways, so it knows when you're buying it and when you're selling it. Uh, is that answer that? Keep okay, Eric brought in. <laughs> Do you trade that back and forth in kilowatts, or if there is a, if you come out ahead, do they only pay you a percentage of what you buy the energy from them? Yep, it's all different depending on depending on the power company and uh, and size. So, for instance, in Michigan, up to a 20 kilowatt system, it's full retail trades. Um, a small REMC in uh, in say Indiana, a lot of times will be you, you, you're offsetting full retail when you consume it, but on that overage, they pay you maybe four cents a kilowatt hour instead of your ten or twelve cents. Um, and uh, it, Take NIPSCO in northern Indiana. NIPSCO is uh, not a dollar amount trade, but it's a, an actual kilowatt hour credit. So it depends on the size and the utility. So following up on this gentleman's question here, um, it requires a specialized meter. I can't just hook up with my meter. I have to, I have to switch out the meter so it knows how to do this sort of swapping thing. Yeah, what happens is the, the utility is well involved in the whole process. So as soon as the system is, is sold on our end, we submit a uh, interconnection application to the utility and that triggers their engineering team to make sure your transformer and your, your metering and, and everything is, is uh, uh, will accept this. And what happens is they, they'll approve that interconnection application. We build the system, we interconnect it uh, to their standards and we tell we call them and tell them we're done and they come out and they inspect it and then they put in they replace the new meter and normally that that uh there will be usually like a hundred dollar interconnection application fee that will cover that meter and that process is that what you're asking do you have more questions okay so there's a gentleman in the back with a green looks like a green hat maybe black yes to the uh guy that it's, has one installed on his farm. How, how satisfied are you, and, and what percentage of power has it proved that you produced? I guess, and, and uh, how you sized, how you maybe a little process of how you sized it on your own, on your own line. Well, to start with, uh, I with Ken to do this. I met him here about three years ago, and uh, didn't think it would be worked out well up north, or in Mid Michigan, and uh, was convinced it was. So he came to. Uh, my house and we sat down and he laid the whole thing out and uh, I said well this is going to be too big to be true so I took all his figures to my accountant and he said this is going to be too good to be true this can't be right and we talked for about 45 minutes as he was working you know these guys can do the task and and uh, at the end he says you know I think this is going to work and it did it worked well for me um, uh, I got in at the right time where I'm not net metering actually uh, the power company pays me more money for my power than I pay for theirs. So whatever I make in my side, my system, I think it's size about 20%, 20% bigger, I think, than what my usage was figured at. They look at your your bills for like three years and they get an average usage and they say, this is all the system you need, you can build. Uh, they don't want you way overproducing, but uh, right now, last year, I've been uh, in, in June, June, I think we put that online, either May or June, uh, it'll be two years. And so I've got a year's worth of data and actually I've got a bill in my pocket if anybody wants to approach me. Uh, my consumer's energy bill, every month they show me a statement and you can see where I didn't pay anything. Uh, and actually I overproduce to the level of about last year of somewhere in the $2,500 they paid me back. They actually write me a check. Right. Any other questions? Two questions. <clears throat> Number one, years of payback for your system that you installed, how many years did you figure for payback? And number two, probably the most important question on that, did you get REAP funding from USDA in your project? My system, uh, 
And in the end, I think it was uh, 61,000 and change for 16K systems. I, I don't have the exact figure, but it was, it was a little over 61,000. I paid up front, I paid that up front. We had really good years in 2011 and so, and, and uh, so I had some money to spend and uh, I just retired about a week and a half ago. So I was looking forward to retirement and trying to figure out how to pay forward some of my expenses. Uh, so I, that's one of the reasons I got into this project. Uh, applied for a grant, we were kind of up against, by the time I got all the paperwork done, uh, up against the time schedule, I only had about two weeks to get this all done to apply for it. I was really sweating that we actually hired a grant writer. I tell anybody to do it, it cost me like $1,200 and I ended up with 15000 about two years later. It took me the second year before I got my money. You know, I, they ran out of money the first year, they reapplied my money for the next year, and I just got that, uh, like last June or July, I got the check for 15000 Any other questions? I think he was asking about your payback, what, what your payback was with and without the REIT. That's correct? Let me make one comment, though, about the rollover on the applications. That was feasible two years ago. As of the new farm bill that was passed, that's no longer available. So you cannot roll that application over. It's a one-time um, fiscal year. But you will actually, if it's an 80,000 or less project, you will compete for funding in five different cycles. If it's over 80,000 project, you'll compete in three different cycles. So you're competing more than, than one cycle, but it's only a one-year process. With that uh, $15,000 grant, the projection was about a four and a half year payoff. So, you know, I, in a couple of years, I'm, uh, it's all free. That's the way I look at it. I put nothing to the system. Don't plan on putting a lot in over the next few years. Any other questions? Other questions? Gentleman up here in the front in the black hat. My farm shop and my residence are on a separate meter from the rest of the farming operation. Would the farm shop and the residents qualify uh, to for, for the for the, uh, the farm shop, yes. The residents, no. And if it's on the same meter, what we'll have to what they would have to do is actually go in and get historical usage for three to five years and determine how much energy is actually being used in the shop, depending on what type of meter you put in. If it's a generation meter, what we call a generation meter or a, a net meter, it will determine what you can do. If it's a generation where the electric company is paying you directly back for whatever kilowatt you're producing, we don't care if it's, you know, at that point it's a renewable. So you can put it wherever you want to like to put it. If it's a net meter, at that point, that's where we have to look and make determine what's residential and what's non-residential. Gentlemen in the front. I'm a little confused on, you said the three cycle. Can you explain that a little more in depth? I don't understand. Like you say one year, but there's three cycles. Oh, on, on funding? Okay. Um, the reprogram for larger projects, we actually have three funding cycles. One would be our state allocation, where you're competing at the state level. And then there's a national pool, and then there's another pool that would basically you're competing in three different pools. So if you're not funded in one, you could compete for the other pools. But it's it's all during a one-year period. So it, it's a process of well, well, we'll do our funding first, and we do the national, and then and then there's a I guess another national too that plays in. But it, you know, government we do everything you know back us. But but um, that basically you will compete for a smaller project. You're actually competing in two state allocated funds, or really. Yeah, two, yeah, and then an additional three. So there's a total of five different funds that you will compete. Now, I will tell you that the national pool is very, very competitive. Uh, when you're considering uh, the Corn Belt states that receive hundreds and hundreds of applications, even California last year, my understanding was that they received enough applications basically to use the whole national allocation. So it's getting very, very competitive. Uh, so if it goes into the national pool, um, you know, the odds, we don't, in Kentucky, we very seldom get an ap application funded through the national pool. It's primarily at the state level. That's just because of competitive nature. 
Gentleman in the white hat. I just want to add something to that. Um, we live on a farm, uh, but we don't farm. We're not 51%. Our earnings aren't 51%, so we can't get it on that side. But at our shop, we apply the shop where we actually do manufacturing and powder coating and so forth. We applied for a wheat grant there, and uh, we were awarded a, a wheat grant. And uh, we're, like I mentioned before, we're put in a 150 kilowatt system. And so we fit into that uh, business in a small rural area, and uh, it works. I mean, um, we got over $50,000 of grant money. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's, it's real. It's, don't just think your neighbor can get it, but uh, you all might want to consider it. Gentlemen, After your uh, <clears throat> system is in and up and running, how long is it and how, what percentage is it? When does the maintenance start and what's the downfalls? I have the mic, so I'll talk. Uh, give Ken a mark break. Uh, so the maintenance, so once the system's in, it's basically a static system, as Mark described, a passive system. So it, it doesn't have moving parts. All that's required from you as a homeowner is to monitor it, make sure it's performing and you know putting out power like it's supposed to, which is a very simple process, um, and to make sure that they, the panels stay clean. So if you install it by a dirt road, odds are it's going to get dusty sooner than it would if it was out you know, in a field somewhere. Uh, so you just want to make sure they stay clean. We've actually done some site visits where customers say, you know, my panels aren't producing, uh, but they were a year ago. Can you guys come look at it? And what happened was, you know, there's there's a dirt road there, so they're not they're not maintaining that. They're not going out there with a pressure washer and just making sure that, that the panels are clean. So, other than that, if your production is within you know reasonable amount of what what we, we told you it would be, and you keep them clean, uh, then all's all's good and well. Uh, so there's really no scheduled maintenance for them, other than uh, just making sure that you make sure that your, your production is good, your inverters are working, you're you're putting power back in there. But you don't grease it, you don't, you don't grease it, you don't drive it, you don't do anything to it. You look at it. I mean, I'm telling you, after looking at it for a couple of weeks, you'll even get bored doing that. And uh, it just makes energy. It literally just sits there and makes energy. Okay, I think we have time for one more. I think we're over a little bit, but that's okay. Let's, let's do one more. Since we haven't heard from the right side as much as we have from the left side, let's get the gentleman in the right hat. Final question, uh, insurance on a system, property insurance, is it recommended that the uh, owner of the system has that type of insurance? And to what degree do you insure? Yeah, it's, it's first of all, it's, it's not once ever been a deal breaker. So it, it's, it's not gonna be thousands a year or anything like that. Um, I know at my house, I'm, I'm not a farmer, but at my house, uh, I'm covered for zero dollar because it's it's within my accessory structure uh, umbrella. So um, it, it's usually depending on what size of system, maybe a few hundred bucks a year uh, baked into your homeowners. Um, it, but it's 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 never been a deal breaker, you know, and, and uh, because they're much more durable than you think. And we've got a video in our booth that I mean they blast. Uh, hail at them at 250 miles an hour. You can walk on them, you can drive a truck on them. It's not, you know, it, it's durable and it sits there for 30 years and, and that's it. But I do recommend insuring it overall. I, I definitely recommend having it insured. Check, exactly. with, your, check with your agent. They'll, they'll tell you everything you need to know, whether it's covered or not. Okay, so that wraps up the questions and answers. So, in conclusion, from our Harvest family to yours, we want to thank you guys very much for coming. Don't leave yet. Hold on. We want to thank our panel, um, and basically we want to say, in a nutshell, solar is a great way to go. Now's the time to do it. If you have any questions, please come see us in the booth. We're in booth 8130 South Wing C, so literally 100 yards to the south. Turn in there, you can't miss it. We've got the biggest booth inside, so come see us. Everyone here will be available for questions and answers. Uh, Eugene will be there as well, uh, so you can get a first-hand, you know, inside information from someone who's actually put it in we're not paying him to be here so you can ask all your questions um, bring your family bring your friends come see us we're here all week so thank you very much uh, remember your farm your future is our focus and in closing mr eric is going to throw you some gifts oh and also look under your chairs
there's a three gift certificate strategically placed for $500 off the solar system installed this year. So see if you're a lucky winner or look around. You, you start up here, you got a lot of chairs to check. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. We really appreciate it.